one. Uh, we've been slowly going through uh, verses 24 through 29. And uh, today we're going to look at this last point, which is uh, verses 28 and 29 concerning Paul's objective. <coughs> Paul's objective. So if somebody would like to read verses 28 through 29, and we'll uh, get into it. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Okay. So, what is Paul's goal here? What is, what is his goal according to verse 28? Complete. Yeah, to present every believer uh, perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. So the goal is to present every believer perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. Uh, mature in Christ. Uh, somebody look up 1 John 3, 2 and see what the scripture has to say about uh, being mature and complete and perfect in Christ. 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Yeah, so there's, there is coming a day in which uh, what we are heading for will become the ultimate reality. So um, we're in process. We're in process. But that's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. Now that I have already attended attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward the goal for the prize of the un upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. The Apostle Paul says, hey, I'm, I'm pressing on. You've heard that old hymn, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, some of you heard that. Some of you are going, what? <laughs> uh, that, that was Paul's philosophy. Paul was pressing forward. He was pressing on. And so uh, he... He says, okay, I haven't gotten there yet, but this is what I'm doing. I'm forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And I press forward to the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, uh, the, our, his goal was that every believer be perfect in Christ, that every believer reaches that point of maturity. And that's his goal for us, too. Saying, yeah, I'm never going to be anything. You are. You're heading on that path. You're on that, that, that uh, upward trend. That's your goal. We're being made perfect. Yeah, exactly. We're being made perfect. It's a process. Process, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, that, that's the key process. word. <laughs> that's, that's process. Anybody ever get it? Are you, you got it all down pat? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Not yet. I'm not. Yeah. This way. Yes. We won't be perfect till we see the Lord. Yeah. There's, uh, <laughs> there, there are days that I wake up and I go, Lord, I committed the same sin yesterday. What's the deal? Well, I'm, I'm still pressing on. So. The goal is to present every believer perfect in Christ. Now, uh, the next thing is the content. The content of this, of being uh, perfection, uh, of being 
of heading toward perfection, <coughs> the content of this. It, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with this because that sounds like works. <laughs> we are bound to heaven by faith right. in that action, but you know, so obviously we're not perfect as we look at it. But well, it's Christ works. It's Christ working in us. It's not a yes. that we're doing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're Good de we're yeah. he declared does righteous he does. legally stand in terms of our standing, but yeah, we're we're far from it still until yeah. until his work is complete. Yeah, there, okay. there's there's nothing you can do, humanly speaking, to get saved. And according to Galatians, there's nothing you can do, humanly speaking, to stay saved. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, we've begun in the Spirit, now we're made perfect by the works of the flesh. That's not what he's saying at all. Uh, I like that, that word progress or process. It's, it's a process. It's a process. Um, so, uh, the content of this process, the content, it says, um, in verse, um, 28, it says, him we preach, him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So the content is the real Christ. The content is the real Christ. Um, you know, in the, in the, when Christ is being written, if you remember, these false teachers are there and they're, they're talking, of, they're, they're pushing their own philosophies. They're pushing these human philosophies and they're saying, yes, this is how you're going to attain this perfection. Uh, and, and Paul says, no, that's not it at all. The, the content of all of this is not philosophy. It, it's not psychology. It's not positive thinking. The content is the real Christ. You're saying, well, there's only one Christ. Well. No, the Bible says that there are false Christs. There are fake Christs. And if you look through the religions of the world, you look through the philosophies that are being taught, you will see very quickly that there are all sorts of paths that people use thinking that that is their key to true spiritual maturity. And the reality is it's not. The content, what we're focused on, is not a philosophy or a, or a system of belief. What we're focused on is a person, and that is the real Jesus. So, what's our method? The method is to proclaim, warn, and teach. To proclaim, warn, and teach. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. So to proclaim, warn, and teach. Uh, Romans 10, 17. Some of you have Romans 10, 17 memorized. That's okay if you don't. That's fine. <laughs> Good thing. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you take notes in the service and, you know, there's a little note sheet in your bulletin, uh, there at the bottom of the note sheet, it has that verse on there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, we grow in our faith through the Word of God which we're going to kind of look at a little more when we get to chapter 2. Um, but that's how, that's how we're maturing. We are maturing through the Word of God. We're going to get, like I said, we're going to get more into this when we get to chapter 2 because 
chapter 2 kind of opens up with all of this. So. Okay, and then third, the approach. The approach. The approach in verse 29 he says, to this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So, Paul is saying, I, I, I labor. I labor. That word labor means literally to labor to the point of exhaustion. Anybody ever labor to the point of exhaustion? Okay, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You're just... You put everything into it and then more. And you always think, okay, there's more that I can do. And you're just exhausted at the end. Yeah. That's laboring to the point of exhaustion. And that's how Paul approached this ministry of, of proclaiming and warning and teaching. He was, he was laboring uh, to the point of exhaustion. And it says that he was striving striving to, to complete the task. Uh, we're going to look at this again when we get to chapter 2, but striving is, is an athletic term. Uh, it, it's, it, it involves the, the work and the suffering that you go through when you're competing in an athletic event. So Paul not only labored to the point of exhaustion, but he, he's, he was striving like an athlete trying to finish something. I love watching YouTube videos of, of competitors who are giving it their all and they're trying to finish a race or trying to finish a match. And you can tell, you look at them and you can tell that they're spent. They've got nothing left. Yet they keep pushing on. Okay, that's striving. That's striving. So how does he strive? And, and this is the other side of this. This is the balancing point of this. He's striving according to the power of God at work in him. According to the power of God at work in him. Uh, somebody look up 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Yeah. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you're looking for a good verse to memorize, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 is, is perfect. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That was Paul's approach. That was Paul's approach as he was, as he was uh, ministering the word to, the, to everyone he talked to. Okay. Now, Believe it or not, we're going to start chapter two. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Colossians chapter two. And uh, we're going to start off with verses one through seven. Uh, before we do, let's take a look at a quick outline of Colossians. Colossians two. Uh, verses one through 15. The theme is really philosophy answered. Paul's going to get into the nitty gritty of, of what the Colossians were, were talking about, what they were promoting. And uh, he's going to answer the philosophy in verses 1 through 15. Starting with verses 1 through 7, and I'm kind of glad we got into this right after we got done with chapter 1 because verses 1 through 7 is really a continuation of of what Paul's talking about with his ministry. Uh, you know probably very well that, that when the Bible was originally written, they didn't have chapter and verse divisions. You know, you, you couldn't look in an ancient 
scroll with the books and find chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It all just kind of continued. And uh, somebody once said, and you've heard this before, that uh, the chapter and verse divisions were added by some guy who's riding in a cart and it would hit a bump and whenever it hit a bump he would put a mark down and that would be the chapter division. Okay, that, that's not true, but... Okay. Sometimes it feels like But sometimes you go in and like this, it's like verses one through seven belong more with the end of chapter one than they do with the, the rest of the thing. So, so that's why. So it, these are for fun. If you really want to have an interesting study, find or, or make your own, because there's computer stuff you can do this with now, uh, find something that doesn't have any verses in it and no chapters in it. Just make a manuscript of chapter one, verse one, all the way down to the end of the book, and then read it and study it and make your own divisions on there. Interesting study. It, it's an interesting study, and uh, we're spoiled with chapter and verse divisions. But anyway, uh, so, um, so, so chapter one, uh, verse one through seven talks about Paul's ministry, it's continued. And then 8 through 15 uh, talks about the supremacy of Christ over false philosophy. And then the second half of chapter 2, uh, and on your, on your note page it says 15 through 23, it should be 16 through 23. Slight little correction there. One of those things that you discover after you've run everything off. You go, oh, that should have been 16 through 23. Oh, forgive me. Thank you. Uh, the, the ritual is answered. So the philosophy is answered in 1 through 15, and then the ritual is answered in verses 16 through 23. And uh, 16 through 19 talks about how Christ is real. Not false worship, but Christ. And then uh, 20 through 23, Christ is powerful. Not the rules and regulations. That's not powerful. Christ is powerful. Okay, so we're now turning to Paul's ministry, verses 1 through 7. So if somebody has Colossians 2, you'd like to read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll get into it. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laosidia, that name, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, Rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Okay, so the, the bullet points of verses 1 through 7. Uh, we're going to talk about agonize, alert, and advise. Agonize, alert, and advise. So let's start with agonize. Uh, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Paul here says, I, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea as many as not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he starts off with the scope of the agony. The scope of the agony. The 
scope of the agony. And he talks about the great conflict that he has, or the great, some of your translations say striving. Some of your translations may say struggle. But this is that word, that same word that we saw in chapter 1 at the end, where he's talking about the athletic competition. Okay, he's bringing that up again. He's saying, you know what a great conflict that I have. It, it's it's that, that, that striving uh, that's required to compete in an athletic event. And people in that day knew all about, I mean, they invented Olympics. They invented the Isthmian Games, uh, which were kind of like second in popularity popularity to the Olympics. I mean, they knew about athleticism. And it's funny, you go through Paul's letters, you see these references, these athletic references. He probably attended a game or two. Uh, he talks about running in a race. He talks about wrestling. He talks about boxing. He talks about all of these things. So, so, so Paul knew what the struggle was. And he says, I want you to know what a great conflict or struggle that I've had. Um, for you, the Colossians, and for those in Laodicea, and to those who have not seen my face in the flesh. So, uh, he's, he's talking about the Colossians, he's talking about those in Laodicea, and by the way, Laodicea was about 10, 11 miles away from Colossae. They're kind of like sister cities. Uh, it's fun, later on, uh, you'll see Paul talk about how uh, we should share this letter to the La to Laodicea as well. So, you know, they, they probably exchange correspondence and everything, but um, he said, okay, so, this is this agony, this conflict, this struggle that I have. Uh, you know, it's it's for you Colossians, it's for the Laodiceans, and it's for anybody who has not seen my face in the flesh. Now, Paul never visited Colossae before he wrote this letter. Probably he didn't visit Laodicea before he wrote this letter. He just didn't get to that neck of the woods. Uh, and there's probably other places that he didn't visit. Mm. So they had not met Paul personally. How far from Ephesus did you say? Uh, well, 10 to 11 miles from Colossae. I'm not sure how far from Ephesus. <laughs> so what is he saying about this conflict here? Is that... Uh something like a will or a struggle or yeah to it, continue on in the faith of Christ yeah it's it, it's the struggle that you face in fact some commentators look at the struggle and and they see it as a struggle in prayer so like the will to continue uh, well there there's a will to continue and, and it's difficult it's like you know he, <clears throat> he's praying continuously for the Colossians for the Laodiceans, for the rest that he has not uh, seen in the flesh. Lord's got a thought here. I can see it on it. Um, I would think it would be the um, strengthening them for the battle against the flesh, the world, the philosophies and idolatries all around. You know, mm -hmm. like how do how would they have an assurance? of everything that is theirs in Christ as all these things are, you know, like Pastor Mike was talking about, you know, the, the battle of, you know, the battle within and the battle <clears throat> around us. Um, and he talked about that picture of victory, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fight. <laughs> yeah. How many of you have experienced, okay, if you're a parent, I know you've experienced this. 
Just you're praying kids. for your kids. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. You're <laughs> praying for your kids. You're mm -hmm. watching their lives. You're trying to infuse Christ and model Christ to them and do all. And there's a there's a struggle in prayer. There's a conflict in prayer. There's just this. It, it's hard to describe, and, and and it doesn't go away when they grow up either. Nope. That's the thing. <laughs> no, it gets worse. Yeah, sometimes it gets worse, doesn't it? Yeah, because then now there's grandkids involved. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't want to listen to you anymore. They want to, you know, do what they want to do. So <laughs> the yeah. more you try to infuse, the more they're going in the opposite direction. So you almost have to model it and let them <laughs> make a decision on it. Yeah. Well, life has a way of pulling them back because you face a lot of stuff in life as an independent adult that, you know, makes you say, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe what I was raised with is, uh, you know, it's obviously true. I, yeah. I, I found that they, teenagers fight it, fight it, fight it, you know, I don't want to go to church anymore. Well, yes, you gotta go. No, I'm not gonna go. Yeah, until they hit about 21, 22, and then all of a sudden, mom and dad are not as stupid as we thought they were. <laughs> you know, and they start asking questions, and and it's not such a fight anymore. But you still pray. Then then oh, you yeah. pray like crazy. Yeah. 21, 22, she's still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we. That's what we found in our house. Yeah. Well, we, prayed. <coughs> we prayed for our son Ted for 30 years and he took lots of rabbit trails mm -hmm. along the way but we never stopped praying for him no. but Lord brought him back around yeah. and he served the Lord today and, and um, if you instill God yeah. in them as a little kid teach them you know they will come they back. will come back in the meantime they give you lots of great hairs yeah well, or, down to individual. Or less. Right. Or less. Yeah. Less hair. Yeah. Less hair. Yeah. Less hair. yeah. Absolutely. Or, or no hair. No <laughs> hair at all. There you go. <laughs> what I found to be true in my own family was it has more to do with control. They just don't like the control anymore. And when they hit their teens, they want to. They say to themselves, "I just don't want to be controlled. So I'm going to do what I want to do, even though it makes sense what you're telling them." So they go in the opposite direction. They get about their thirties, and they say, "Hey, wait a minute, this stuff wasn't all that bad." <laughs> right. You know, right. But it takes a little time to get to attain the wisdom to see it. So it has more to do with them not wanting to be controlled. Yeah. So if you model that kind of a life and let them make a decision for themselves, it usually has more of an effect than you telling them. Yeah, so that's what I found yeah, in my family. Yeah. You have to kind of live, walk the talk. You have to be sure and not say I told you so. <laughs> yeah, you have to bite your tongue and not say those words. Right. Because they'll come back and say it to you themselves. Yeah. Well how, you told me. <laughs> it's like, well how many of you had the experience there. and I I've had this experience myself where you're praying for your kids. You're saying, Lord, they're they're constantly they don't do what you they they're, they're not obeying me, they're not listening to me, they they want to go off on their own direction. Lord, why do they do that? And God says, hmm, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Or remember when you were young. Right. Yeah. We, we learn by our mistakes. That's yeah. for sure. That's like, right. That's right. Or at least, you know Linda, what you're talking about. Linda, or at least when you're younger. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway. So, anyway. So, Paul is, Paul is, is centered. He's, he's praying. He's agonizing in prayer for these people that he had not even met in person. So, is that our next film? And that's, that's the... We're still on the first one okay. there. So um, so that conflict for the 
the Colossians and the lead to sins. Okay, next week we'll start in uh, at verse 2 and talk about the purpose for the striving. Why is Paul putting on this much effort on these people we've never even met? Well, we're going to find out in verses we'll 2 and 3, and, and we'll move on. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, caring for us. And Lord, we have been the rebellious children. But Father, in your grace and your mercy, you have uh, brought us closer to you. And you're bringing us closer to you day by day. We're not there yet, but we know that that, that is the goal in our lives. We praise you and we thank you for that. Guide us and lead us this week. Uh, may we continue to keep our focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.